Hello and welcome back. If you follow the channel, you know that we are involved in the restoration of an amazing mechanical analog computer from early fighter jets, the Bendix MG1. This computer is one of the first iterations of an air data computer, a machine able to calculate all kinds of important parameters such as the altitude, Mach number, air density and true air speed of early supersonic fighter jets. While Master Ken is busy reverse engineering all the gears, I am gearing up to figure a way to test this monster. Air data testers are a staple of aviation certification, and aviation safety depends on them. Therefore, even the worst testers on eBay are worth a fortune. But there was one in the UK that was under $200. Now, as you'll see, it's not the latest model, nor any close to working condition, which in our channel, we count as a plus. Handle with care. Yeah. With Royal Air Force sticker. Then you open that up? Under authority of the king. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's the king now, it's not Her Majesty anymore. Oh, I got the little. Oh wow! That tells me what it is. It has a. <gasps> yes, I was. The ejection handle. It has a little pop. Oh, Ooh, it's a little crustier than it appeared in the picture. This is how it looked after the restoration. You will see. Let's admire the dials and gauges for a minute. Oh, it takes three phase. Oh, there's yes, the date. There's yes. The date code. Stamped. 86. 80 something. Or inspection. It does say 1986 on it, but as you'll see, the technology inside is from the late 50s or early 60s. This must be a refurbishment date. External suction. External pressure. Safe position. Open, close. And, and then these are where you hook up your tubes. Yeah. And this one you just go. Ooh. So what does this machine do? It's written on it. It's a pitot-static tester. It has two air outputs, one that connects to the static port of the airplane and the other one to the pitot tube. It is able to very accurately control and measure these two pressures, which our air data computer takes as inputs to make all of its calculations to be later used throughout the aircraft. I expect tubes and steam machine inside. Oh. Appetizing! Oh! This is a corroded over here. Alright, here's the animal. Oh, that wouldn't work. There's something that's been disconnected. This is more electronics than I'd expect. There's another bunch down at the bottom. The, the bellows are kind of kind interesting how they very slowly... Oh yeah, so, so that's the whole beauty of the thing is to get pressure to the exact, very exact the amount. Yeah, so the, the meters have these huge mechanisms, but I can turn the gear manually and move the, the needle. Yeah. This side moves nice and smoothly, but the other side is totally locked up. Yeah, that might explain why they had one of the, the boards on that side disconnected. Yeah, it looks like it's stuck here at 10.5 and just will not budge. We think we already found the problem is here. The mechanism is moving, but it's stuck at the motor, and you can tell that there's some corrosion. So we have a frozen motor that would explain why they disconnected the thing, probably heating up or something. So I've unlocked the motor a little bit, but it appears that it's doubly locked. The motor is locked, yes. was locked, and the other, the, the, the counter over here is locked too. Something not right with that screw. Badly cross-threaded or something in the thread. 
and you can tell it's been completely mangled okay I'll get it off camera okay so I got my screw out and you can see water made it into the measurement instrument actually to get to the mechanism take the needle off and there were two little screws and that goes off and now I can try to figure out why this is moving this is moving this is completely stuck I managed to remove the big bellows that was in here I removed some piping and got our stuck mechanism out and these are the Geneva wheels that will flip them one digit at a time three Geneva wheel, three Geneva wheel, stuck Geneva wheel I did put some oil right next to it and I think now it's yeah ha 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 there we have it oh actually maybe it's here I'm thinking it turning over here which I didn't expect ah uh, there we go we have so action now the next one is sticking okay more strategic oiling it's getting better it turns a bit but you can tell how hard it is here okay meet my exerciser or pressure reader and that's the best method I have found. Try to take it apart. That was really difficult. And that seems to loosen it up. It's like butter. It fixed it. And nice and smooth. It was so crunchy before. Okay, so it seems we have reco recovered some functionality. Here we go. Although I'm still a bit worried about my, my motor, sometimes it sticks. Alright, we took care of some obvious mechanical faults in the machine, but there is much more going on. Taking a step back, this machine has two halves. The left half is concerned with creating the pitot pressure, with the output tube marked P towards the top, and the right half does the static pressure with the output tube marked S. The static pressure is always lower than the ground pressure, since pressure goes down as altitude goes up. So it is connected to the vacuum end of our double-ended pump. The pitot pressure is always higher than the static pressure, so it is connected to the pressure side of our pump. There is an automatically controlled equalizing valve in between the two that will prevent the pitot pressure from ever dropping below the static pressure. Most of the complexity and the precision of the machine is in the indicators, the static pressure transducer and the pitot minus static pressure transducer. The static pressure transducer measures the pressure in the static port. The P minus S transducer measures the difference between the pitot and the static pressure, essentially the excess pressure due to the airplane speed through the air. To achieve the high required precision, these transducers are complex servo control indicators. A very sensitive balance beam produces an error signal due to pressure imbalance between two pressure capsules. An AC air signal at 400 Hz is picked up by a magnetic winding and is amplified by the electronic boards, one of which we found disconnected. The output of the amplifier drives an AC motor. The phase of the air controls the direction of the motor and the amplitude controls its speed. That's the motor that was stuck when we first got the machine. The motor then winds up a precision tension spring which force is added to the balance beam until the beam is brought back to balance. The air signal then goes to zero and the motor stops. The dial then indicates the position of the spring which is a very precise measurement of the pressure difference between the two capsules. On the static side, capsule A is the vacuum capsule and capsule B is connected to the static port, so it measures the absolute barometric pressure. On the pitot side, A is the static pressure and B is the pitot pressure, so it measures the difference between those two. The electronics are definitely old school. 
The AC amplifier is using transistors all right, but its schematics looks like that of a tube amplifier. Probably one of the first transistorized circuit that these engineers designed. The 1960 date at the bottom confirms our hunch of when this was designed. The power supply is a simple unregulated supply. Should be simple to check and repair, right? Well, we'll see about that. Uh, I took the power supply out and that is the filtering capacitor. I've never seen one like this. And it measures 49 microfarads out of 50, so seems to be good. And here's the amplifier board with good old germanium transistors, OC28, so that's European. And then the uh, regular power ones are OC72s. And then it's not even a PCB, of course. And here's the other amplifier board and the capacitor at the end looks a bit crunchy. Okay, so not a good cap indeed, it's leaky. 10 kilo ohms. All right, so new cap here and I checked this one, it checked good, uh, it was perfect, so. Okay, so we're ready for the power up. I made a little cable that goes to my 400 hertz supply, three phases, and there's actually a little indicator that's going to tell me if I got the phases right or wrong. This guy over here has four indicators, one for each phase, plus one that tells you if you got the phases right. So those three should light up in this one. Uh, one chance out of two. Three phase test. Oh yeah, look at that. So we got the oh. phase right. Then if I turn it on, I disconnected the one on the right, which was disconnected when the thing came. And then see if we get some servo action. Yeah, it went up. Okay, it did something. Okay, pitot input. Yeah, okay, that's working. Now let's try the second one. Connect it. Yeah? Uh, but yeah, it's stuck. Oh, maybe. I think it's sticky. Okay, so it's not quite working. So I went ahead, capped the pito one and hooked up the static to the altitude. The altitude thing works. So it's just not reading correctly over here. But now if I turn it on, huh? it went somewhere and then it got annoyed. So this one, since I left it at atmospheric pressure, Okay, it's going down. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, see, it's not. So I don't know if it's the pressure sensor itself or the servo loop that's not working. This one works great. If I do equalization, there we go. But this one should follow this one, and it's not. So I think I got in trouble. It started not to work anymore and I got some uh, large power draw and I think it's this amplifier. If I turn on the power supply, that's the input, that's the output looks good. As soon as I put this guy on, the power supply cannot do it and this resistor here gets really hot. So I think one of the transistors is shorted in there. Since the whole thing is all transformer coupled, there's no way to measure the transistor in circuit. I have to take them out of circuit, which fortunately is not too difficult. Hopefully, there's one. All right. 
test those two. So it doesn't appear to be the transistors. Those are good NPN transistors. PNP, sorry. So with very low germanium forward voltage, 100 millivolts. I took them off and put them in the transistor tester and they, they are good as the ohm meter says. And here I have another problem. This is an open, the wire is broken in here. That's a transistor wire, it got broken somehow. This is way worse than I thought, as the, the leads disintegrated, were completely corroded. As soon as I touched that, it went to nothing. Now I have to find OC-72s, good old germanium transistors. Okay, we're safe. Thanks to viewer, I got a whole bunch of old germanium transistors, and we have here an OC-76. It's a successor, so it has a little bit better voltage characteristic that will work right in. So I'm a, I'm a little bit worried that all the transistors are in that state, like this one has only two leads remaining out of three. It looks like these have been replaced already. They are not the originals. Okay. Uh, look at how pretty they are. Resistors are in. No, I just need to rewire them. By the way, you could be fooled that these old transistors are in a metal can, but they really are not. The can is a glass ampule with a metallic foil added on top. Once you unwrap the metal foil, you can see the transistor chip, apparently stuck in some silicone grease material. If you break the glass, you can look at your beautiful germanium transistor. As you'd expect from late 1950s transistors, these are alloyed transistors. Most of the germanium chip is the end-doped base of the transistor, and the emitter and collector are formed by alloying two dots of solder on either side. The solder is chosen to be a P-dopant. When it melts at very high temperature, it forms the collector and the emitter, while soldering the gold connection wires at the same time. It is possible to make them in a small laboratory alloying furnace, but that's an experiment for another day. For now, let's see if we repaired our amplifier. Okay, it's all pretty and repaired. The question is, is it still going to bring down my power supply or not? There we go, we still have a good power. And it's very, oh no, look at that. I still get the power problem. Oh dang. It's really weird, it works for a while. So right now it's doing fine. Uh-huh. I know, there you go. Now it's starting to become unstable. What the heck? And I can't really tell if it's the power supply or the amplifier that's causing the trouble. So this is the app I tried to repair and I put it on the bench and ta-da! This is 2.5 millivolt RMS in and I'm getting like 10 volts out. So this is great, I repaired the amplifier, works beautifully. So the fault is in the power supply or it has to be the power supply. And while I'm at it, I'm testing the other amplifier uh, that was from the side of the meter that was broken. If I give you an input, there is nothing. So that amplifier ain't working. Except when I just power it up. Okay, so something's wrong with that amplifier. Same problem as on the other board. The, the leads have completely rotten. Alright, replace the transistors on the first stage this time. And it was the same thing as the other one. These were the original ones. This one had already been replaced. Try it on. Here we go. I have amplification. 
Uh, what is not that nice though is that this is 5 volt power supply. Then when I put it up to 15, where it should work better, all of a sudden it degrades. So there is another fault somewhere. Well, it looks like it might be the next stage that has the misbehaving transistor. Feed the next stage directly from the transformer. I'm measuring the output right after that stage of two transistors and I'm losing one of them. So here is a transistor that could explain my problem. Starts good, looks like a transistor, normal. Then at 5 volts it goes bad. Well, the other one is even weirder. Same thing. So this one just, just breaks down at no voltage at all. Okay. Okay, now repair the second pair of transistors too. Let's connect 1.4 volts. Ta-da! Some of amplifications just bring the supply up. 5 volts. Oh, and now it keeps going up. And here we go, 15 volts. It works. Okay, so we have recovered two good amplifiers. So I am now suspicious of the power supply, but I mean, it is nothing on it. It's not even regulated. And I check the diodes. They are all good. There is one cap in there, but that's that's a newer one that has been changed. It looks super new. Measures 49.3, supposed to be 50 microfarads. ESR of 660 milliohms. Because I'm running off other bright ideas, I replaced the cap anyhow, but mine looks weaker than theirs. I don't think that's going to do anything. So I think I'm getting somewhere finally. I put my power supply back with the new capacitor and it was still making the ugly noises and all the voltage I measure AC and DC are about twice too much. Uh, so I lowered my AC power supply to 60 volts per phase, which is half of what the doc says and half of what it's written here. It's written 115. And guess what? Doesn't make any angry noises anymore. I should have 15 volts. I have 15 volts to be putting my pressure. There we go. No more angry sounds. This side seems repaired finally. So we have half of a precision barometer to work. Let's put the amplifier on the other one and see if it works now. Aha! Uh -huh. So, uh, this I know it's hunting. It's supposed to do that. When it's at the end of its range, so that's probably zero. Huh. Okay, I think I've repaired the mechanics. I think I've repaired the electronics. No, it's something with the pneumatics. That's not quite right. I'm afraid there's something wrong with the pressure capsule. And so this is how the sensor works. You have two capsules. Uh, so it measures the difference in pressure between the two capsules here. And then it moves that beam. And when it's high, you pick up a signal of a certain strength and polarity. When it's slow, you pick up well the inverse polarity and, and, and strength. And you can see that I have removed the two amplifiers. I'm just coming up on the, I'm just measuring the pickup signal here at this magnetic pickup. And green is this side, blue is that the, the side that, that doesn't work. And you can see that the green side works fine. I'm going to put a little pressure up on the beam, super sensitive. Whee! 
and I have an out of phase signal when it's up. I'm going to put a little pressure down. I have an in phase signal. So right now I'm on the side that doesn't work and I'm moving the beam up, pushing on it and it moved a little bit but then I hit a stop and I cannot move it down easily either. I think I have come to a conclusion that I have a problem with the air signal pickup mechanism or contraption. It's, it's called an ENI head so you have an E like this and an I that's in the middle and it moves very little. So here's the ENI sensor in question, right? When you have this closer to this, then it should pick up this phase. And when you have this closer to that, it should pick up that phase. That, so there's almost nothing I can break in that thing. And so those are wound in different opposite direction, of course. So I can't figure out how something could go wrong. It tested the continuity of this stuff, it's fine puzzling. So very little bit of progress. I have removed the mechanical stops around the ENI, which allows me to wiggle the thing a little bit. And I get more signal in one direction, but I can never null it. So we are ticking the right thing. It's just not centered properly. That, 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 that zero detector is not detecting zero. I have some progress. I have with great difficulty untightened the head and now I can move it around a little bit and see if I can find a zero. And I sure kind. That's the green line. Okay, so it seems like it was a rotation adjustment. And that the thing, if I readjust it properly, will find a zero. Okay, I think after an afternoon of fighting with my ENI detector, I can finally detect a zero. There, that's a zero. That's in phase. That's out of phase. So my guess is that when I put the amplifier and close the loop, it will work. Okay, I've reconnected the amplifiers and my expectation is that, is that it will work. Mm -hmm. Yeah! No, it works. Okay, well, except... Huh, it works. I want to... Now I have to recalibrate the whole darn thing because I, I I went to the end of travel. So I sort of work partially. Let's try it again. Okay, so my pressure is diminishing and I'm at end of travel here at 16,000 feet, so some more work to be done. So it's now good detecting a zero and balancing a beam. The problem is that if I pump it a few times, a little bit more, but 16,000 feet is I think where it happens. There you go. So at the end of travel, I thought I had to readjust my end of travel, but no, because it's at the end of travel of the spring. So that's correct. That has nothing to do with my beam. You see my big spring, it's all overextended. So if you look at here, there are two capsule and a spring. And what it does is tensions the springs to get that beam, beam horizontal. And you can never tension it hard enough, so... And what I'm afraid of is that one of the capsules has lost pressure. And I think it's this one. This one should be vacuum. This one should be whatever the static pressure is. 
And if that one is not vacuum anymore, then it will expand and it will push the beam down behind what the spring can do. And I am afraid that's my problem and the capsule is pretty rusted out. And that's exactly what happened. I untightened the capsule over here and it went poof, it expanded like crazy because there was no vacuum it anymore in there. And I retightened it and now it measures with the normal range of the spring, right? So I need to either fix that one, fix the leak and put a new vacuum in it or buy a new one, which is going to be next to impossible. All right, that's a bit of a downer after all the effort. I thought we would get it back to 100%. But it is still a very useful tester. It creates accurate and finely adjustable pressures in both the pitot and static tubes. It measures the pitot minus static pressure correctly. However, it now measures the static pressure by comparison to the current ground pressure and not the absolute barometric pressure. So the ground pressure always reads the standard 10-13 millibars, no matter the local weather or altitude. We'll need to add a small correction for the barometric pressure of the day, which I can read off the altimeter. So in the end, it will do what I wanted it to do, which is to test our air data computer. In the meantime, with a little bit of elbow grease, I can pump myself up all the way to about 50,000 feet. Not bad for a hand-operated steampunk machine. And when I let the air out, it's a scary plunge from there. Enjoy the ride and see you in the next episode.